Okay, welcome back for session nine of 120B, 220B. Let's go ahead and get ourselves started. Today, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about structure and how we model structure and create linked versions of models, where we model structure very effectively, and the way to actually mirrors the way that we do in the industry, where uh, we try to go through and create good structural models, which have good approximations of all the different member sizes, and kind of show how we're thinking about everything being all linked together, but that we're really getting all ready for the idea that we can do analysis to um, size things up and really make sure that they're going to be adequate to carry all the loads, stuff like that. So, a lot of what we're going to do today is really thinking about an overall structural strategy and how to go through and illustrate that in preparation for them, like actually doing the testing and actual sizing and the numbers and pull it all together. And we'll do this in a way where we're linking together models, which is a way of uh, kind of creating several different model sets that all work together by linking the other models as opposed to putting everything in one big model. You're going to start to see there's an advantage in that if different people are working together on a team as consultants, uh, everyone can sort of have responsibility and ownership of their part of the work, but we can all see each other's work and like uh, cross correlate across these different things. So we want to sort of be together but still a little bit separate because just the reality of the way we work in the building industry is uh, different people are responsible and liable for different aspects in different trades. So. Uh, very often the engineers who are responsible for the structural want to isolate their work from the architectural work and vice versa. So that uh, we coordinate so we can't accidentally override each other's work. Okay, in terms of uh, high level stuff going on this week, we have, relative to the whole integrative design project, this is the week where really, you know, things should be moving into sort of a basic structural form where in this week, oh, and we've moved beyond sort of the basic building layout. We hope that have a pretty good sense of where the outer wall they are and what the kind of main core features and kind of main spaces are. Now, in check four, the idea is to really start thinking about that building in terms of how it's structured and then supported. So this is the time where we end up putting in grids and we put in like uh, beams and columns and some of those things to actually kind of get very real about how the whole thing is going to be supported. So we'll illustrate that today in class. Uh, hopefully, if you've been doing some drawing and sketching and some new modeling, this will be very relevant to kind of get you going. Relative to, oh, just check-ins, people have been doing really good about the check-ins. Two different things always to kind of remember to check in. A, if you can, go through and post something to the design journal. And if you're a little bit behind, you can go through and take what you have today and just like, Put it out there, everything's just sort of a work in progress, but if you go out there to Pentopia, let's take a look at what some of the latest ones are. So that's Norbert's right there. Here's Peter's right there. Let's see what else we got going on in there. There's Carl's. Basically, um, here are all These different entries. In this case, it looks like we're looking at the overall space summary and how that's all going to work in terms of the overall space planning. Just go ahead and post things out there because then it's really uh, easy for all of us to take a look. If you put a teaser image again, it'll show up on the front page. If you want to see what everyone's doing, just go to spring 2016 and choose 120, 220B, and you'll get everyone here. So uh, we have Peters. Oceans. Just learn from each other in terms of just really taking a look at what other people are doing and kind of it'll help you to sort of scale and understand what everyone's up to and hopefully you'll pick up some interesting like uh, design tips from each other. So just go ahead and take advantage of that but also for yourself. Go ahead and yeah, if you haven't posted much yet, start posting some stuff. And it's quite okay. Some people have very finished looking models, other people have sketches, and you can back there. Go ahead and just take a photograph of your phone. The same thing. Just take photos, put it in there, it's a good starting point. Just you know, the first one's always the hardest, and then it gets easier after that point because it's really uh it's just all work in progress. So go ahead and that? See, sketches are good. Let's see what the envelope it looks like a lot of sun analysis right there. But go ahead and share. Sharing is really the heart of all this. We're going to all learn from each other. Okay, for check in times, we got some times available today and on Thursday. 
let's just kind of see how we're doing on that front. If I go back over there and go to the calendar. No one is taking us up on the offer today. If you, we're, we're going to be here. Whether you are or not. From 3.30 to like oh, 7 o'clock tonight or something like that. So if you have time this afternoon and you just want help modeling something or just getting through things, please feel free to sit around at the end of uh, class today or check in sometime early in the afternoon. It's like we have four people signed up from 30th grade. We'll add some more time on Wednesday afternoon and also some on Friday. But uh, go ahead and again, just take advantage of those. Yeah, don't be shy. Come with what you have and take advantage of uh, the time we have. And we are certainly aware that it's a tough time of the quarter um, in terms of other things to be available or do in you know, other classes, like in all the PDL people, it's been very, very hard trying to get ready for the last couple weeks of that. There's lots of things going on in many different things. So, so don't be embarrassed or shy if you don't think you've pushed the envelope very far yet. You know, and, you know it's just all progress. So you know, bring your uh, pseudo-baked ideas. I want to, that sounds better than half-baked, because <laughs> there's no judgment implied in it. But bring your work in progress, and we'll work on it together. OK, let us go back to what we're going to talk about today, and that is mostly structure. OK, so in terms of structure, we talked a little bit last time about this whole notion of really just being different strategies for uh, you know, how we can go through and think about our structure versus our uh, wall system and how they're related to each other. We'll kind of look at some more examples of that today, kind of on some real projects. But in general, as we're thinking about like carrying things down, or we looked at these sort of different load carrying strategies, let's just kind of go back to the things that we are actually trying to design for. Okay. Which is typically, we have two categories of loads that we're going to try and sort of work on. One is the whole idea of gravity loads. Gravity loads you're typically very familiar with. That's all the different things that are just ultimately pressing down. Gravity is trying to attract them back to the Earth. So we have dead loads like the building materials itself. The building is considered a dead load. It's not going to change, hopefully, very much over time. Live loads are things like people and things that move continuously through the space. They're also like what I call transient loads, snow and rain and different things that are applied temporarily, but they're not applied in sort of a very steady state way. Okay. And in terms of that, we do all sorts of modeling. We'll actually model some loads on your buildings, but we typically model most of these things in terms of pounds per square foot and do our best assumptions. And then we think of different sort of load cases that combine them together because you're never quite sure if you're going to have a lot of people in the room and rain on the roof or just what the correct combination is going to be at any one time, so we have different load cases that are defined that way. In general, our goals for gravity loads are twofold and pretty straightforward. In general, you don't want things to move down, you want to keep things up. Okay, so whether it's a floor or a roof, you don't like to move down very much. But a secondary goal, which often is the dominant one, is we don't want things to flex or deflect too much. So most materials, if you put big loads on them, will deflect over time. You know, wood certainly does that. It's a very flexible material. But even like steel and concrete, flex. They do move, and we try to make sure that they don't flex too much. And we have guidelines for that. For most things, oh, for flexure, we'll look at either an L over 360. We'll take the length of something and divide it by 360 and say that an acceptable deflection would be L over 360. So if you had like a 30-foot long beam, okay, it could deflect up to an inch. So 30 times 12 divided by 360. So that's considered OK um, and sort of normal. Um, there's a tougher criteria, L over 480. That actually uh, says we'll divide by 480 instead of 360. So that would limit you to like 3 quarters of an inch. Things are stiffer. They don't flex as much. Um, that tends to be good in cases where you have uh, something which is what relatively what what the, the requirements about how much deflection and how much steadiness you need are pretty high. A stiffer floor, like if you had oh, some sort of a production lab uh, that was doing very high-tech design or manufacturing, you don't want the floor bouncing all the time. So a stiffer floor in there typically helps out. Yeah. Often we use all over 360. 480 tends to be a pretty good criteria too. It'll be very interesting on some of your structures, like for Rubia, when we think about this tree-like structure, like how much deflection really happens at the end of the trees, and how we sort of like uh, model for that is going to be very interesting. 
Okay, but we tend to carry those loads down through, we have planes like roofs and floors, we have columns and walls to support those, and then ultimately they bear on the foundation. And we'll look at how you model all three of those different things, but yeah. Okay. Lateral loads are another system we're going to want to talk about. Lateral loads are the other side of the equation. And these are, we learn about them very much here in California because we're subjected to them. Yeah, at a high level, everyone is subjected to wind loads. So no matter where you are, pretty much in the world, you're subjected to wind loads. And often wind loads dominate. Isn't that strange? Because we always think about things seismically here because we live so close to the earthquake fault. But you know, for buildings of almost any height, wind loads are actually the dominant forces. Just as you sort of move up on a tower. So let's go ahead and draw our tower here. So this is my ground plane. This is my tall tower. What happens is as we go through and think about the loads on the building, the higher you get, they get stronger. So you tend to have something that looks like that, where at the top of the tower, we have these very, very big loads, not so much at the lower parts of the tower. But basically, up in here, we have an awful lot of lateral sort of moving and kind of pushing on it. So what happens, almost as we are drive here by accident, the building will shear over a little bit. It will sort of deflect in that direction, too. And we have to watch out for that. That's distinct from, oh, the whole notion of the seismic loads. Seismic loads we're very aware of, just because we have to worry about not every day, day in and day out, but in the event of a big kind of seismic event, of a very strong sideways load kind of being applied to the building. Our goals are generally keep things from moving sideways or folding over. Interestingly, that tends to be the problem. It's not so much that they move sideways. Let's kind of draw this real quickly. We have our ground, we typically have, we're sitting on some sort of foundation. Then you have your building on top of that. So if I go through and apply some big lateral load from an earthquake, like that, we don't want it sort of to move sideways. And how we usually prevent that is we'll have, oh, lots of little uh, connections between the building and the foundation to keep it from moving sideways the anchor bolts or something that's just kind of keeping it from shearing sideways. The problem though, what we tend to happen or have had in the past with older buildings isn't so much that. That we're actually pretty good on. We know how to sort of keep things from moving sideways. We bolt them on down and that's kind of good. Where we've had a bigger problem in the past, although design's gotten so much better, was this. When you apply that big load, what happens is the building starts bending. So it starts doing this. When you put that big load at the top and it does that, or it does this, or finally it just flops over completely. And that's what I mean by folding over. We particularly have a problem where most of the damage has happened in a lot of the buildings around here is in an earthquake event, the lower floor, which is often a garage or something that doesn't have much lateral support to it, just uh, folds over because there's really not a whole lot of resistance there. So we try to resist that by putting shear walls or braces, things to keep it from folding over sideways. And that's just sort of generally true. As we look at your buildings, we're going to go through and apply both those things. So in a typical building, we're going to have something that looks like this. I'll draw it in section now. I'll say that's the ground plane right there. What's going to happen is we're going to have some sort of foundation whether it's a bunch of little footings or piers that go down into the ground, I'm not really sure, but it's gonna have some sort of connection to the ground, okay? On top of that, we are typically gonna have, oh, a series of different floor plates. Maybe this is a plate for the second floor, and this is a plate for the roof above it. Again, I'm drawing with one finger, so I'll apologize that. Okay. What we'll do now is I need to go through and carry the loads on those different plates down to the ground. So what we'll do is either through walls or columns or something like that, we'll go through and set up a structure where we have columns, and then we have beams that come across. And very often we'll stack them right on top of each other. And have the beams coming over like that. So. 
That's generally what we do in terms of the gravity loads, is we find either through columns and beams or walls some way to take the floor loads on down to the ground. For the lateral resistance, what we'll tend to do is, you see, this still has the problem where those things could fold over sideways, because it's just like a big old stick figure. So we'll do one of a couple different things. We could go through and put in braces that look like that. Those are good in that that X bracing or a K bracing pattern will keep it from folding over because if it starts to fold, one of those will tension up and like I try to hold that rectangular shape. So we'll use a bracing strategy or if that doesn't feel too good, we'll go through and use like a braced frame sort of strategy. We'll make a frame which is made of all sorts of very heavily reinforced steel where it keeps its rigid shape, and that rigid shape really keeps the whole thing from coming over. Okay, the other thing that works so well to help with this is also if you have a building core, like an elevator shaft or a stairway shaft, often that's like some big concrete element, so it can also help brace things from moving sideways. So that's the real high level in terms of loads, the type of loads, and how we're going to start approaching it. But let's go ahead and kind of look at it just in terms of Revit and how you approach it over there, because it is really pretty straightforward. Now some of you, let me just check, because some of you have some experience. Like Peter, I know you modeled it in A. You did it on that side. And trying to think, who else is around? Did you take A? You did A, okay. So you, you did model a little bit of structure there. Okay, but from some of you it'll be new. So this, at the beginning, may be a little repetitive, okay, with the A stuff in terms of getting going, but hopefully it won't get too boring. We'll try to make it more interesting soon. But for some people who are new, we're just gonna get them started with just how you model the basic structural elements. Okay, so let's start out with how we approach this. So what we tend to do is, rather than trying to put everything in that single architectural model you've been working on, is we'll set up a series of linked models, okay? And we'll create a separate model for the structure and link it back to the architectural model and put our elements in the structural model, okay? And as we go through and create our structural model, we'll use the structural template because it has lots of goodies in there that help out with the structure. We'll link the Revit model to it. And then finally, we'll go through and like uh, create some views to focus on the architecture elements. So let's just give you a sense of what that looks like. If you can, for example, go over to Revit and in today's folder, there's a couple of different uh, kind of models that might be interesting to you. Uh, let me go on out there for a second. Why don't we go through and start with, I have one that says model linking, but let's start with one that says the classroom building. I think the classroom building is a pretty good example to start with because it's actually sort of a more developed model. So if you can go over there, let's say files, session nine, go for classroom building. I'm gonna open it up on this side. Okay, so if I open up Revit over here, Let's just take a look. What the classroom building is, it's actually a model that Autodesk supplies that shows it's basically a classroom building, an architectural model, a mechanical model, and a structural model all kind of working in tandem with each other, all working in parallel with each other. So it's a good example of model linking and how you tend to structure these things. So if we start with opening the architectural model, let's see a little about the building, the way it is set up right now. Let me go ahead and open. It's still working on something. Okay, um, all of Revit is currently like a single product. A couple of years ago, it was actually three separate products, but they all unified it. So we can open any of these models at the same time. Let me open the architectural model just to give you a sense of this building we're looking at. This may look very much like your building so far. Let's we'll open that and take a look. So this is a little uh, three-story building. Lashing away, having a good time. It's actually a pretty well-developed building, so I highly encourage you to look at it at some point. Let me look at it just in terms of 3D view. 
There we go. But it's bigger than most deer buildings, but it has all the essential elements. You sort of see we have a lot of facade system work going on here. We have some big solid facades and sort of more curtain wall facades. Over here on the side of the building, we actually have these like uh, shade structures too. So interesting elements kind of hanging around out there. Make some skylights. So this is a pretty good sort of overall building model. It doesn't though at this point really have a lot of structural information to it. So if you go back and look at the floor plans or something like that. Let me go look at the floor plan at the entry level. Yeah. It is. You might borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that we do have, well, actually in this case it looks like some of the structure is showing. We'll take a look at that time for a second. You can see all the main rooms, these conference rooms, these doors, the stairways. It's a pretty good layout actually. All the typical rules, stairways coming down, exit from the stairway. So it's got some good egress going on there. You can sort of see though, let me see if I can grab it. There is in here, a concrete column. It's actually sort of in there. In fact, if I zoom on out here, it's kind of interesting. There's two models sort of mixed together in this one. You'll see there's a couple of big things going on. At a high level, there is a series of grid lines that has been imposed on the overall structure. And then what you can actually see is the structural elements are lining up with the grid lines. So that's a very common way of doing it. We often go through and put a grid in there and then line up the structural elements with the grid. In terms of the order of operations, we'll typically lay out the grid on site, build the structure first, and sort of build the envelope around the structure. So the grid is often sort of one of these really dominant elements that really indicates the entire form. And if you come back over here, here's the cafeteria area up on the side. You sort of see here is the grid. You have the structural elements inside here. These are the ground columns. Notice that here, all the structural columns are sort of inside the structure. So they're not actually right in the walls. The columns are all being exposed right now. And that could be quite OK. It's an architectural effect. It's quite OK. You could go ahead and try and put the, the walls right on top of the columns, but they don't have to be. And it's almost easier not to think about it that way. OK, so here is a structural system. But the big thing I want you to notice here is we got all these grid lines that are going to indicate all the column locations. And they've tried to do a pretty good job of aligning the grid lines with different things. Like, for example, here's a grid line coming across. It sort of aligns with a facade on this side of the building, something like that. It looks like there's two grid lines here inside the um, upper <coughs> wing of floor uh, rooms, below the lower wing of rooms. OK, so let's go ahead and look at this a little bit differently. Let's go ahead and open up the another model that's in there, which is the structural model. <coughs> also here hanging around in Revit. So let's take a look at this one. This, this is what we're going to create next. We're going to create a structural model somewhat like this one. This is just really the structural elements that are inside there. So here you can actually see the deep pile foundations. You can see the floor slabs. You can see the uh, openings in the floor slabs. You see the columns coming up between the floors. You can, in this one, start to see that most of the building tends to be just a series of different columns. It's like some different sizes. Kind of interesting. I never noticed that before. There's also these what I'll call shear walls or structural walls down at ends. You got a little canopy there at the front. A pretty basic little structure here. It's very common. This sort of very simple frame is probably the most common way most buildings do get put together. Although we'll start looking at some other conditions that are a little more elaborate that you might need for your buildings. But the idea is we're going to try and create something like this and link it together with the architectural building. Yes? So is the floor in the structural model the same floor? Actually, there's two different ones that are in exactly the same place. So here's one of the issues that's so interesting about when two different people sort of work on the model. It's that at some level, the architect wants to put a floor in because the architect needs a floor there. 
The structural engineer would also like to have a representation of the floor because they want to put loads on it and understand it. So what we actually do is we create two different versions of the floor and we link them together. So we do something called copy monitoring where we set it up so that if the architect created the floor, we make a duplicate copy of it in the structural model and then those two models are linked, those two elements are linked so that if either person changes them, okay, the other one will know. Okay, but ultimately in your model, when we finally display it all integrated, we choose to display one or the other. Okay, but there are two because they both sort of need the floor. Yes, Ruby. Have you added dimensions for the element? Oh, for so many of these things, we're going to start just by guessing based on our previous experience what we think some of the dimensions will be. And then we can then take these to analysis packages to go through and size them. So at some level, we know that, oh, we want to have some sort of a round column over here. We're going to guess that it's a 450 millimeter column. If I orbit around here a little bit, you'll see there's some beams in here. So we're going to, based on our experience, sort of guess that this is going to be a 400 by 800 millimeter beam. But it could turn out to be different. And that's going to be OK, because out of this model, we can take it to analysis and resize it. And then the beam location is probably accurate. It's just the size that needs to change. What will happen is we'll sort of lay, put together the layout or the connections between all the elements in Revit, and then we'll take it over to analysis. Analysis will go through and help us figure out if they're adequate or not, and sizing them. And then after we make the changes, we'll bring the resized members back here. And it'll change it to a different size. So if, for example, we know that's the right location, but it turns out that beam needs to be bigger, it needs to be a 600 by 900, okay? It'll swap that in, and then this model will be updated. So hang on, it's just sizing it right now. Okay, it just got to be a little bit bigger. So it's interesting that you could actually sort of separate the whole notion of placing the beams from sizing the beams, or that given that that is your location, we're going to compute the right size. Okay, I just adjust them as needed. Yeah, but very good question. Linking is where it starts getting interesting because you have two different parts of the brain that have to work with each other. And like, uh, it's hard to keep them all coordinated, but we have some good tools for doing that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start with an architectural model and then make a structural model to go with it. So we'll demonstrate how that works. Just so you sort of get a sense of how the complete picture works, though, let's go ahead and also open up the mechanical model, just so you see. This is one we're going to use a little bit later in the class. We'll say this has a mechanical model. Let's open that. So in addition to that architectural and that structural, a mechanical engineer is designed a complete system with ducting and air handlers and all that piping and uh, electrical that's going to go through and support the building. And this is a small piece of it. I kind of show the whole building over here. Okay, there's the whole building. So in here, all those duct works, the piping, the air handlers, they're all put in here. This actually has a very similar algorithm to it in that. All these ducts, all these uh, pipes, they all have a size to them right now. But actually, we can compute what the size needs to be and then resize them. So we know that we, for example, want to put a piece of ductwork here. Currently, we guessed it's 225 by 225. You'll see it's a little bigger as we go back upstream. It's 425 by 350 there. But we can go through and compute that and let the analytical tool do that for us. Okay, so it's our demo algorithm is start with the placement location and then let the uh, calculators go through and help us figure out the appropriate sizes. Okay, so does that make sense? Okay, let's see it in action because then it'll make more sense. Let's go ahead and close this up. And we're going to start just by creating some very simple structures. 
How about, I'm gonna think it's in my uh, structural linking one. Let me open up that folder and see which model I want you to open up in there. Okay, say so open in the structural linking folder, or model linking. Let's go through, and I'll just say simple building shell. Let's open 0A1. Not the greatest model in the world, but it'll sort of illustrate some very basic principles for us. If you look at the different floor levels, you see at level zero, zero, kind of my basement level, I have kind of an overall sense of kind of this enclosed sort of semi-underground space. It's open here on the front. You notice I have a little core going here. I got some stairs. I got some restrooms. I got some suggestions for where some of those things may be eventually. Okay. I also have some grid lines. Now these grid lines are really just suggestions. Yeah, I was thinking ahead that, oh, some of these might be some good locations where some columns could be, or really where some just key relationships are in the building. So for example, yeah, there's an edge right here. If we go to the second floor, I have sort of a balcony that has a little bit of an open atrium. So it makes sense like this line three is just behind me. I'll probably have some sort of columns or something supporting the edge of the balcony. So let's go up to level two, for example. Okay, there's the balcony. You can sort of see what I have going on there. Going left to right across the building, it looks like I have just A, B, C, D. I'm trying to hold within the structure a little bit, thinking that it's gonna be a steel frame structure. It could be concrete, but it'll be inside the skin of the building. So I have sort of an approximate gridding system here. Now, when you think about a gridding system, um, not every location has to have columns on it. In fact, we'll play some games about how you can get rid of some columns because you don't want your whole floor to be a big forest of columns that is supporting everything. So we can do an awful lot with cantilevers or hanging things. A lot of things we can do that's really quite interesting to kind of keep the floor open. But these are some approximate locations where I might want to go through and put some things. You'll see this bottle has a floor in it. So there's the floor. We'll copy that in. But for the most part, I have level 0, 1, and 2. Okay, and you can look at it on the outside. But this is just an architectural model. Now, you can go through and, I even have some junk in here. You can go through and basically uh, put in uh, the grids in your architectural model, or you can save that over the structural model. Either way will work. Um, uh, how about, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave them over here for right now. And then we'll go ahead and work it over on the structural side too. Okay, so here's the architectural model. It all starts with that. Now it gets interesting. Here's how you create a link model. What we're going to do is say let's create a new project. Actually, even here. Uh, before I do that, let me go to manage. I'm going to unlink. I think I have another one sort of already linked in here. I do. Let me remove that. Okay. I don't want to clutter up your uh, kind of vision with the, uh, the stuff you were doing last time. Okay. So I'm going to say, let's do a new. It's going to be a project. It is going to be a structural template. The reason I want to do a structural template, structural template has all sorts of goodies loaded into it that make structural modeling easier. It has boundary conditions, uh, it has load templates, it has a lot of stuff in there that is really better for doing structural modeling. So we're just going to go with that as a starting point. Say okay. You're going to get a big old blank screen. It's going to look like our floor plan view, but there's not going to be anything in it just yet. Okay. 
Those are our elevation markers around the outside of the building, but there's nothing in here just yet. So we're going to get these two models together, and here's how we do it. What I want to do is I want to link to that architectural model. And linking is kind of a really cool relationship. In a linking model, I can see, but I can't actually touch the inside. I can sort of see through and observe and find out about it, but I can't make changes to the linked element. Okay, and that's kind of there for protection. How we set that up is as follows. Well, if I want to link to another model, I can't actually keep it open for editing at the same time I'm linking it. So I'm going to have to close the architectural model so I can link to it instead. So let's go and do that in the background. I'll go over to my architectural model. I'm going to hit this button. This is close all hidden windows. That'll close everything except the one window that's open. Because then I can only close a single window. That's just like random rabbit tricks. OK, I'll go back to here's my structural model. And we're going to link it on in here. And when I link it on in there, there's a couple things I want to do. Is once I link it in there and I'm looking at it, I want to go through and copy some things that are useful. If I have any grids, I'll copy those because I want to use the same grids. I'll copy the floors because the floors are also going to be useful to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with linking. And here's how it works. If you go to the Insert tab, you can go through and link together other types of models. We can link in a CAD file if you have a DWG or something from another CAD program. If it's a Revit model, you can just link in from Revit directly. So if you say, link from Revit, and then I choose the simple building, okay. I am almost ready to make the choice. There's one last thing I want to show you about. That's this notion of origin to origin. Here's the deal. When you're linking things, there's a relative position of the two different models. And by default, this used to say that it was going to be center to center. Now, center to center sounds wonderful. The problem is the center of your mass of the building may change as the building gets bigger or smaller. So it's not really a good stable point to look at. It's actually better to change to origin to origin. That means that your model has a 0, 0, 0 point, and my model has a 0, 0 point, and we're going to link those things together. So no matter how the size changes, they'll always stay coordinated with each other. OK. So I'll do a little uh, zero to origin to origin. Bring that in. And you will see that what we have is not much, but it's there. Looks like I can see the grids. Looks like I can see the stairs. Looks like I can see oh, some structural walls that might be the elevator, but I can't see all the main walls. Okay, But they are there, you're just not looking at them. Let me look in 3D. Okay. Here you sort of get a sense of those are the structural floor, those are the floors. And that's the structural walls over there on the elevator. So I can see some stuff in here. But here's what's going on, just so you sort of know. This object that is floating around in here, if you try to click on it, will give you a big old blue box. This is the you can see but you can't touch box. Okay, so that is the extents of the architectural model. And I can click on that box, it'll select the entire architectural model, but I can't really kind of get the elements inside of it. I can tab and actually select them, but if you manage to select them, you'll see that they're all grayed out. They don't want to change anything because, again, they don't want you changing it, they just want you looking at it. Okay, so if I would like to see the rest of the model, here's what I gotta do. Okay, where am I? Back over here. We linked our Revit model in, we did that origin to origin, now I'm going to say create some views to showcase the architectural elements. And here's what we have in mind. Every view has a property to it, including which discipline that view has been created for. Architectural, structural, or coordination. It's also uh, mechanical too. But in a structural model, it will show you structural elements, but it won't show you the architectural elements. In the architectural, it often won't show you the structural elements. Coordination is kind of the superset. It'll show you everything. Okay. So for every view, if you're not seeing what you think you should be seeing, 
watch out for what the discipline of the view is. And discipline's one of the view properties. I'll go through and change that to coordination. Okay, and now I see a little bit more. Not everything, but I see a little bit more. Okay, so now it's showing us at least the non-structural walls in addition to the structural walls. Okay, now beyond this, I can continue to add more things to it. The next thing to watch out for is just the visibility graphics in the view. And I think in our view here, just things like, oh, the curtain walls just turned off because typically by you know, structural drawing, we don't show the curtain walls. But if you want to see one, what you can do is visibility graphics. So it's under view, visibility graphics. Turn on the curtain wall mullions and the curtain wall panels. Okay. And that looks a little bit closer. So you're starting to see that building inside of there. Although what is a very handy thing to do is actually create multiple different views so you can switch easily back and forth between them. So for example, this is what I'll call my coordination view. This is when I want to see the architectural and the structural together. So no worries. What I'll do over here is I will just duplicate this view. And I'm going to give it a new name. I'm just going to call this, rename it as kind of 3D coordination. And the reason I'm doing that is just because I want to have a view that I can quickly pop to that will show everything together. But let's also go through a great one that's just 3D structural that has none of the coordination in it. Okay? And to do that, what I can do is just duplicate this view. And I'll rename that to be 3D Structural. Now, the name is one thing, but if I really want to show structural, I'll change the discipline back to structural. And that way, I'll have two different views, one for coordination, one for structural. OK, looks like for this one, I should still go back and hide. I'm going to do visibility graphics again and hide my curtain panels. So all that's really just about you have different views. Be aware that in different views, depending on the discipline and what's hidden or not hidden, you may be looking at different things. Okay, so that's not too bad. The next thing, though, we want to play with is this whole issue of, hey, we've got some nice looking floors over here that I, as the structural engineer, are allowed to get a hold of. In fact, we haven't paid any attention to it, but let's look at what's happening with the levels, because the levels probably aren't quite right either. By default, Revit always has these levels that go 0 and 10 foot, maybe a 20 foot. This one, you'll see, has some levels. There is 0 and 10. We also have these other levels. There's minus 14, 0, 14. Hmm. OK, so let's think about what's going on there. What's happening is these levels, 0 and 10, those are the levels that are in the structural file. And this level right over here, I can tell since I can't click on it, is actually part of the linked model. It's part of the architectural model. So I got these two different level systems, but no one likes two different level systems. I like to get them in sync with each other. Okay? So what we're going to do is something called copy monitoring. This is one of those things we copy. We tend to copy the levels across and sync them. We copy, if there are grids across, we sync them. And then we we'll typically copy the floors across. That way we have a little ball through those. Yeah, Ruby, what you got? Yeah, could you repeat again why we have two different levels? Okay, what happens is these two here and here, those are ones that are in the structural file, and these are ones that are in the architectural file. Okay. And in the structural file, it opened to 0 and 10, because that's the default. In the architectural, we might have changed the floor to floor height. So what we need to do is just get our structural and our architectural to match each other. So that's why they came in separate. But this next step is going to work the same for we're going to copy the levels, we're going to couple the grids, and we're also going to go through and copy the floors. But it's going to be called copy monitoring. And what that does is establishes a link between the files and those elements. So if anything moves, they both move. And they stay in sync. 
So here's what it looks like. You can do this uh, for the levels. It's easiest to do it in the elevation view. We'll say, let's go ahead and go to the collaborate tab. Collaborate, because theoretically we got a couple people working together. And we're going to turn on this thing called copy monitor. So when you choose copy monitor, you get to say, is it going to be from this project or from a linked project? And we're going to go to a linked project. It's a linked architectural model. Then it's going to want you to basically, it says way down here in the corner, pick a Revit link instance to monitor. So what I'm going to do is just click anything in the link model. Probably the easiest thing to do is just click on one of those levels. OK, now they're linked, or it's understood. Now I'm going to do some copying. And for copying, what I'm going to do is choose everything one at a time that I want to copy. I'm going to say copy and choose it. If I choose copy, let's go ahead and let me start with level three. My model doesn't have a level three right now, so I am going to choose it. Or my structure model doesn't. Okay. What it's doing right now is it's creating a level three in my structural model. First one always takes the longest. Now, this looks incredibly unexciting because when it creates the new level three, it puts it exactly on top of the other level three, so you can't see. They're just right on top of each other. Okay. But there is two different level threes right now. When we do level two, that may be a little more interesting because there you'll actually see. When we click on level two, it'll shove this one up and bring them into line with each other. So if I click on level two, Brought it up. Now, level one looks kind of like it's already set, so I don't need to do anything. But just to be on the safe side, it's good to copy level one across also. That way, if there's a relationship, if anything changes on level one, it'll change on both. So I'll say level one. And finally, but certainly not last, or last but certainly not least, we have level zero. There's not a level zero in this project right now, so I will click on that. I'll make a new level zero. Okay, so after selecting those four things, we now have two copies. I have a copy in the architectural, I have a copy in the structural, and they're going to stay in sync with each other. Let's just pause there for a second. That kind of makes sense. Go ahead and do that, and if that's looking pretty good, why don't you say finish? We at least have the levels all copied across. We're going to copy a few other things in there, too. What's going to happen now is if I make a change as a structural engineer and the raise level 3, the architect will get notified. If the architect changes level 2, I'll get notified. OK, so it's sort of, uh, just a way of keeping track of each other. Now, as a structural engineer over here, you might notice, well, hey, I don't have structural plans for level 0 and level 3. Why not? Okay. And it's just when you're copying across, it doesn't create them automatically. But we can create them. If I want to create a floor plan for those views, it's under the View tab. So if I say View, and I say it's under the Plan Views, I'm going to create a new structural plan. And then I can choose. You see, it sort of tells us that level 0 and level 3 don't have structural plans. So now they're in the list. They're just, they were missing just uh, from the list, but they did exist. Okay. So we got this uh, fantastic link thing going on. We got the structural plans that are coming across. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to try to bring across, just so we would have it available, are these grids, because these grids would be nice to sort of keep those in sync between the architect and the structural engineer. So if I want to keep those grids in sync, I'll do the same thing. I'll say, let us go ahead and collaborate. Copy monitor from a linked project. I'll choose that. And now I'm going to copy those grid lines. One.
First one's always the slowest. Two. Three. Now, if you're going to do a button, where that is is right here. There's this thing that says multiple. That'll let us choose that one. I can control click and get that one. I can control click and get all these. What that'll do is now I have six items selected. I have the one, two, and the four across. So I can say finish my selection. And now I can finish that. But this is going to have the net effect of, I have to go back to copy monitor, giving me 16 or eight different grid lines there. Or what is it? No, eight, uh, four and five, nine of them. Okay, so I got some grid lines. I got some uh, kind of, uh, what is it, uh, levels in there. The last thing that you might want to copy in there, which is a, certainly a very good thing to do, let me just look at the structural model, 3D structural, is get those floors, because again, I want to get those floors over in the structural model so I can put loads on them, just the same as the architectural model has them. So I'm going to copy monitor, they copy those three floors. So I'll say copy monitor, use a linked project, and then I can copy these floors. Oops, I'm gonna get that fourth one too while I'm at it. Okay, and finish that. Now I have copies of the floors that I can work with. Now the nice thing about my copy of the floor, you might remember that it was a generic floor over in the other model, and now it's a likely concrete on metal deck. I can change its properties, I can apply loads to it, I can do all sorts of things that I want to do as a structural engineer. And if I change the shape, the architect will here, if the architect changes the shape, I'll here. This little thing that it almost hard to see there, it looks like a little heartbeat or a little pulse sort of symbol. That's the thing that indicates that these things are copy monitored. And it tells you basically what it's linked to. So we now have this model, and we are ready to start placing structure elements. Now, if you are, you know, got lost along the way in terms of copy monitoring these things across, and you want to sort of open up something that already has a copy monitor across, we have that model for you. So if all this copy monitoring has you feeling a little lost, do not worry. What we are going to do is have you open up structural model linked to the architectural model. If you just, oh, I think that's it there. Although that may be a little bit earlier in the process. Hmm. Let me go and do this. I'm going to go through and save this one out just so I can put that up on the server so you can get it to, to, get to it too. Project, say, I'll say zero. A4, can it be struct with arc linked and uh, elements copy monitored? And that boy's not a weird name, but it will sort of be clear. And I'll put that up on the server in case anyone wants to grab that. So over here, I'll upload that same file. make that available to you. Okay, so it is hanging around out there. Hopefully that's a, a useful one for you. With this model hanging around out here, we are ready to start placing some elements in it. And we'll start with some of the simplest stuff manual. We're going to start by just putting a couple columns in there, maybe a beam across, just something like that. This is very much like looking with like an erector set. It's just kind of putting things together. 
If you prefer to, what would you prefer today? You, you want to work with a uh, steel structure or a concrete structure? Steel. Steel. I'll for steel. <laughs> I go with whatever. Okay. To do this, let us say that I'm going to go through, and I'll be on, oh, let's say level one right now, and I'm going to put a few columns that are going to go from level one to support level two, and maybe a little bit of the floor support for the level two floor. So here's how you can do that. If you go to level one, okay, and if you go to level one, you have all these nice looking grid lines. So level one's hanging around. It's got some nice looking grid lines in there. In general, what we do is we use those grid lines as our basis for placing the columns. What I can do is actually place columns at the grid intersections. That's a very kind of common thing to do. So if you're going to place some columns in there, let's go ahead and go to the structure tab. I'll grab the column tool. And we'll choose just some shapes. This has some concrete shapes. It has some wide plan shapes. We could really go either way. I'll just go through and I'll guess these are going to be 12 by 40s. And again, that may prove, be proven wrong, but the analysis tool will tell me. Now we're ready to start placing them. So I can zoom on in and place some columns. So if I place that column, you notice if I hover right over the grid intersection, you see everything turns blue? Okay, that's indicating that it's recognizing those two are the places that it's going to stick to. So I'll put one of them in there. I can put another one over here. As I'm placing them, if I want to rotate the column, I can hit the space bar and it will rotate through some different orientations. Maybe one over here. And again, I'm just going to put them in there oh, a little haphazardly right now. And we'll go through and fix that in a second. Okay. If, as we keep going, we decide that we want to go through and replace some of these columns, I'll show you some column placement tricks in just a moment, or I'll do that after the break. Let's connect these together with, oh, actually, I got really sloppy there. I forgot to show you something. Let's go back and take these columns. This column goes from level zero up to level one, and I'm on level one. Okay, let me show you what happens here. When you place a column, you have the choice of either saying that you want to go down to the level below or up to the level above. You get a choice, and the reason that choice is there is that structural engineers and architects just think differently. Structural engineers often say that if I'm looking at level one, I'm going to do the structure supporting level one. Architects often say if you're doing level one, I'm going to do the structure that's going up to support level two. The net effect in the end is the same in that you can, if you put them from zero to one, or, well, I put them in from zero to one. If I put them from one to two, let me put another one from one to two. I'll say up to going up to level two. I'll put that one over here. But you'll see if I go to 3D now, let me uh, just go to the structural model. These are all going from level zero to level one. This one's going from level one to level two. But if you happen to put them on the wrong level, and I do this all the time, so I'm just gonna control click to get a bunch of those. You can just say, let's just change that from level one to level two. Yeah, I'll just shift the boundaries. By changing the constraints, now they're jumping up. Okay. So we got a little something going on here. Before the break, let's just add some beams in here, and then we'll bring it all back together. So I'm going to put in some columns. That's the starting point. Let's go ahead and put in some beams. For some beams, what we tend to do is use the beam tool, and we connect between the two different columns. So if I choose the beam tool, and I say again, some shape, I can choose which plane to put them on. In this case, if I have these columns that go from level one to level two, I'm going to put them at level two. That would be the top of the columns.
but I'm also going to turn on 3D snapping. 3D snapping means that if I get close, it'll actually grab on right to the end of the beam. So let's put some beams in here. And I'll put one going the other way too. I was kind of clicking out. <coughs> okay, so I got a little bit of a structure going on here. Let's talk ever so briefly. One last little thing to worry about relative to steel, and we'll take a break, is that these beams are hanging around and the floor is on top of them. And well, maybe the easiest way to show you the issue is to draw a section to kind of show you the problem I'm about to have. If I go through and I cut a section right through here, and I look at my beams. Right now it's a little hard to see the beams. What's happening is this is called a coarse view, and in the coarse view, the beams are represented as this like flat line. It's hard to see what's going on. If I change it to a finer view, it'll show the actual beam thicknesses. Okay, and let's see if I can figure out where my problem is. I think it's right here. There it is. Here's the deal. Can you see this beam right here? Can you spot any problem with that beam? Take the pan deck on the concrete. Okay, so that's not good. So what I want to do is whenever you have steel beams, we're going to lower the steel beams a little bit just so that they don't intersect that. The way to figure out how much that should be is if you choose that pan deck, you'll see that's five inches thick altogether. So what I want to do is for all those beams, that beam, that beam, that beam, and that beam, I'm going to go through and just change the top. The top right now is set to be a Z offset of zero. That's exactly at the floor level. If I put minus five inches or minus zero oh five, minus zero space five, that'll lower it down five inches. Okay, now it's dropped and it didn't look very exciting, but if I go to the section, you'll see now it's writing below. And that's what we actually want. So that's what you have to watch out for in steel. Just always watch out for that height thing. But let's go take a look. For the most part, this is looking pretty good. We can go through and just add a few more of these. Maybe I'll do that at the break. But basically, it starts with just going through and adding things like this in the structural model. And what we want to do is then get our structural model back into our architectural model. So you can see the architecture and the structure. You can see the structure and the architecture. And we'll do that when we come on back for break. But let's do that. Let's take a break for five. Come on back. And we'll link it all back together the other way. And I want to show you a couple of variations, things that so to make this go very quick. And also we'll talk about some conditions that aren't so rectangular and how we start handle those or aren't so regular in their form. So let us go ahead and break and come on back in five. <laughs>